out mid class? Tisk tisk. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> yeah. Well, you guys ratted him out, so. I didn't say any names. I just came down to this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you mean you want to write an essay right now? <laughs> uh, okay, let's talk about group robotics. Um, groups of robots must interact with each other, as you can imagine. Yeah. We knew. We knew that you were gone. Yeah. Uh, Coordination is the arranging uh, of robot behavior without direct cooperation. So it's kind of like a strange way of putting it, but you're not having the robots actually explicitly cooperate with each other, um, uh, but you have them work together uh, anyway, I guess. So. The robots don't know they're working together, but they are. That's how it kind of works. Uh, benefits of group robotics. Some tasks require multiple robots. Some will be completed faster with multiple robots. Uh, distributed sensing of an environment can happen at all if you have uh, robots that are distributed around the environment. And there's robustness because if one goes down, another one can take its place, that type of thing. Um, group robotics is like why we have group peoples. So it's there are a lot of things that are easier with multiple people. Um, like, for instance, moving anything um, is easier with two people than it is with one. Well, most things are easier with two people than it is with one. Um, especially if it's like an awkward thing that's hard to carry. Maybe it's not super heavy, but it's just awkward to carry. That is a, an example of, of uh, when a group is required, and that's the type of thing that comes up in robotics where you're trying to do something and if you have one robot doing it, it's hard, but maybe it's way easier if you have two robots doing it. And maybe the easiness is not linear in the sense that it's twice as easy. It might be like a thousand times as easy if you just have two robots doing it instead of just one. Or it might be impossible. Or it could be impossible. But robots are pretty scary, so I wouldn't put it past them. If you've got like a 10 pound block and a robot is only capable of pushing 8 pounds, two of them could push it and one could not. But what if that one robot was super cute and had some <laughs> other robots that helped? <laughs> or maybe it got like a squirrel because the squirrel <laughs> was interested in helping. I'm just saying, one robot. <laughs> Has <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I'm just saying that robots are going to start recruiting squirrels soon, and we should be prepared for that eventuality. Yeah. Yeah. Squirrels are pretty cool. Um. They're humongous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Challenges of group robotics. You could interfere with each other, kind of like challenges with groups of people. You could interfere with each other, right? Communication can be hard. Once again, with groups of people, communication can be hard. Uncertainty is, it can be cumulative with group robotics, so you could have one robot saying, I'm 10 feet from this monument, and then another robot, uh, you, it tells another robot, and the other robot says, oh, well, I'm 7 feet from you, that means I'm 17 feet from the, from the uh, monument. Well, you're accumulating error when you do that sort of 
that sort of thing. So you can, it, it is good to use that uh, sharing information and that type of thing, but you can accumulate errors with that, just in the same way you can accumulate errors in uh, many things if you're not careful. So it's just good to be aware. And also, of course, uh, robots are expensive right now, so cost can be an issue with group robots. Um, I heard that the, the, the monies got approved for buying everything for the lab a couple days ago, and so I'm going to get those robots ordered ASAP, and we might be able to get these two mobile robots here before the end of the semester. If so, then uh, we'll definitely have to play with them. Um, I don't know what we'll do with them yet because uh, that wasn't... I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have that as part of the course initially because I didn't know if we would get them in time. So, but I, I want to at least break them open and try them. So I think that'll be fun. Really the next step is world That's right. And since we have two, right. we're going to really <laughs> leverage that group robotics, robotics aspect. And yeah, yeah, this, it's pretty much... Um, a foregone conclusion that will take over the world once they arrive. Yeah. <laughs> but there you go. So homogeneous teams contain robots with identical interchangeable members, um, and typically with identical programming, which makes sense, right? Uh, and then heterogeneous teams contain robots with different non-interchangeable members, sometimes uh, at the hardware, sometimes at the software level. Homogeneous teams are obviously simpler and more robust because of all the redundancy. I don't think there's an E in redundancy. Uh, and heterogeneous teams can perform more complex tasks. So that makes sense. Merely coexisting teams do not communicate, and sometimes individual robots can't even recognize each other. Loosely coupled teams have minimal communication and cooperation, and individual robots can typically recognize each other. And then tightly coupled teams uh, communicate and cooperate extensively. Robots communicate to improve perception, to synchronize action, and to enable coordination and negotiation. And uh, they can either explicitly communicate or implicitly communicate through affecting the environment, which is an interesting concept, and they named it, strangely, stigmergy. And... This is a little video of Stigmergy happening. I don't think there's any audio. This is similar, this is essentially the example that I was telling you before. Bonus points if you know the composer. <laughs> so you can tell the kind of the, the rules that they have are like to go forward until they can't anymore and then back up, turn a little bit, and go forward. I 
I think it's Mozart, but I'm not positive. It's not Mozart. Yeah. Reminds you of what? Yeah. It's really hard to Google it. Yeah, it's really you know, this part is like. Uh, the... Okay, these robots, obviously far from optimally piling all these things up, but the final cube <laughs> it wanders around for an incredible amount of time. <laughs> it doesn't know what it's doing. Keep in mind, right? Very obviously. It's merely existing. Ten robots, ninety-four minutes to gather them. So so I think it, and Swarm Intelligence is also a band. Um, Stigma G, I mean, I actually, I don't know, so calling that Stigma G is a little bit of a stretch, but I couldn't find a video that was a little bit better of an example. That's it. That was it. Yeah. Uh, find, but so it's hard to find one that actually shows. But so the idea is that you can interact with each other through the environment itself. Now these guys, this is sort of an emergent behavior. Well, it's definitely an emergent behavior um, that it collects these cubes, right? This, these robots collect these cubes, which when you set a bunch of robots loose and they just run around for ninety minutes. Um, you're certainly not explicitly telling them, put them all in a pile. Uh, and so I think that it is a clear case of emergence that we have them all piled up at the end, which is pretty cool. Um, Stigmergy is, is, is typically thought of as being a communication that, that happens by a robot communi communicating to another robot by changing something in the environment. Um, and one way that you could do this is, uh, for instance, like if you went along and uh, like dragged something behind in the dirt that made a trail wherever you went or something like that. So that would be one way of affecting the environment that could communicate to another robot. A robot went by here and this is the path that the robot took. Uh, that would be one way to use Stigmergy. Um, this is, I would call it more emergence, but it's it's a related concept, and, and to a certain extent they do communicate because through the environment. Because when they pile something up, notice that when they got like three or four of the cubes together, it was causing enough friction to stop it, and then it would leave the pile. That was um, it left a cluster there then and so it kind of communicated to another one that experienced that cluster that oh here is a cluster back away and then like go run around and then if you happen to have one or two cubes when you hit the, the cluster then you stop leave them there and that's how they kind of pile up so I don't know it's pretty cool so it is a little bit of stigma G but it's not as obvious as some other examples would be but I couldn't find the other examples on YouTube so what do you do? You just settle. You settle for this. Centralized control has a single controller for the team. Uh, distributed control has controllers distributed throughout the team, typically a controller for each robot, and they may communicate and coordinate. Typically, the uh, distributed control is considered to be more robust, if you can do that. Um, but there are challenges because computing resources uh, being distributed is usually difficult to do. Um, you have limited computing resources. 
if you have some central computing resource, then oftentimes that one resource can be quite powerful. But uh, then you have to do the communication problem, and you have to make sure that they're always in communication, and that there's not. What do you do when you lose communication uh, with the central controller? Is a kind of an issue. So um, one of several issues. The inverse problem is the problem of determining individual roles for local distributed control that exhibits specified global behavior. It is generally very difficult. Okay, uh, and that's what we've been talking about with emergence a lot, right? And trying to figure out how to do this simple set of rules that creates something that's cool and that works. Uh, deliberative control is typically used for centralized control. Reactive, hybrid, and behavior-based are typically used for distributed control. Any comments on that before we talk about learning? The synergy need to be intentional? Or can it just be like... No. Well, I guess, what do you mean by that? Like, uh, let's say a robot has a wheel that leaves a trail in the dirt. <clears throat> does the other robot have to know that it's following another robot? Or is that just... So, so not really. I mean, it, what it might do, the other robot might do, is look for, so say it has a vision system, to look for a line that is on the surface of the of the playing field or the dirt or whatever uh, and if it, if it sees that then maybe the algorithm is to try to follow the line so, so it's not technically communication between the two I guess, I guess the information is so it's not it's not it's really difficult for, for us sometimes to to talk about because we're, because we're always putting ourselves there and then there's this like consciousness that uh, knows what it's doing um, I would say that mostly these systems that we build nowadays they don't really know what they're doing but they have rules that make them do something that might be useful and that's the direction right now is to do that whereas Something that is showing high levels of intelligence would know what it's doing. Like for instance, an, even an, an animal that's tracking another animal, um, it has, it knows the signs of this other animal, like a paw print here or a hoof print there or whatever it is, a broken twig, and. It has the intention of hunting and killing this animal, probably. I don't know. We don't know what animals, how, what, how they experience the world, but it seems like they kind of know what they're doing to a certain extent with things like that, like they're, they're trying to uh, find dinner and they're doing that intentionally. And so that would be more advanced than most of our robotic systems right now, which are probably more along the lines of saying, Oh, my algorithm says line follow. <laughs> and well, it's, I think it's an open debate. Uh, I think that that I mean, self consciousness, self awareness, and intentionality is those are sort of some concepts that are swirling around in that, and they're very, very unclear, and people debate about them a lot. So I don't want to give you like a like one answer like this is definitely the case, but as far as the concept of stigmergy goes, it doesn't require that, that there's a sort of uh, understanding of the significance of what it's doing. Um, it's sort of like the ants that we talked about, like they follow the pheromone trails. I'd say that, you know, I could believe that an ant knows that it's following another ant's trail. I could maybe believe that that's true. But I, I am highly confident that the ant has no concept of optimizing the food sources near the nest. I don't think the ant has any clue about that. But it's doing that, and that's pretty cool. I mean, it's, so it's emerging, even though the ant doesn't even know it's emerging. And so there's this, there's this aspect of, the, of life that 
is very mindless and just sort of goes forward based on reactions. And that aspect of life seems to change over to another intentional aspect of life that is planning and thinking and, and uh, has intentions. But it's very unclear if there's a sharp div division between those. It seems like it's more of like this continuum and then higher animals become a little bit more and more able to be uh, intentional and conscious and lower animals are less so. And then humans are a really big mixture of unconscious and conscious. Yeah. But using ants to maybe see the swarm controls, and ants actually have different hierarchies and specific casts for different purposes. Yeah, so there's a lot of research on that. More, they can do all sorts of extremely yeah. human activities. You can anthropomorphize them, but they're obviously you know, not really intelligent as individuals. So. Right, it's, um, so that's, that's one of the things it, that... So they, I mean, they, they call it swarm intelligence is, is one of the ways of, of describing it. But it's, it's intelligence that emerges from, from a lot of individual components doing their parts. And, and humans have, I, like our bodies have a lot of that going on, right? Like we have a lot of little individual cells that are doing their thing. They don't know what the whole body is about, or they don't have any self-consciousness or awareness as far as like we would think of it. Um, but somehow, what emerges from that is what we experience of the world, which is this continuous stream of consciousness, which is weird. And I've never, ever felt comfortable with that idea <laughs> that somehow all of these little micro machines are just doing their thing and then all the organs and all the systems are working. And somehow I have this individualized experience from this body. It like, it like freak, like literally freaks me out. Um, it's weird. It's really weird. It, trip, it really trips me out how that happens. Um, I don't understand it. But I think that there's a really interesting aspect of the world that um, and I think it's what we find most interesting in the world are, are other beings that have that, that aspect. So that's why I think we like humans a lot. We spend a lot of time with them. We have relationships with them. We don't really do that as, as much with lower animals. I mean, like, you can have pets. They have some amount of it. But then, like, people who have, like, pet tarantulas, I'm like, what are you getting out of that, bro? Like, I don't get it. Like, I don't get why you have a pet tarantula. Like, he's cool to look at, I guess. Yeah, there you go. Um, I, I do think that, I mean, well, some of it's just pretty to look at, like fish. They're pretty to look at, but there's, like, not a lot going on. Um, so, I don't know. Okay, so, good. So, let's talk about learning. Uh, robot learning is its ability to obtain new knowledge and skills and improve its performance. Robot, uh, robots can learn about themselves, their environment, and other robots. Reinforcement learning is based on trial and error, and it's really common. Um, it's, it's, a clear, it's a clear way that humans learn is by trying something, having that not really work, and then trying something else and having that work a little bit better and then going in that direction. Um, uh, exploration is a robot's attempt to try all possible actions in all possible states, which is obviously uh, impossible for very complex systems in finite time. Uh, exploitation uh, is a robot's application of what it has learned. So it's not enough to just like know that this is how things work for a lot of robotic systems to be useful. Uh, so they have to actually exploit it. Um, for instance, my dog is really smart in some ways uh, and not so smart in other ways. And I'm still like, I'm watching him trying to understand how he's learning. It's really interesting. So he has a pen that 
it like rearranges. So uh, and and he jumps on it and pushes it, and so it's indoors, and it's sort of as like little puppy playpen, and like if we are trying to put him in timeout, or if we're gonna go uh, eat dinner or something, we're gonna put him in the pen, and he has to stay in the pen. And so the pen. Uh, when he's not uh, uh, confined to it, we leave it open. We open with a panel, and so there's always like when he's outside of it, there's always a panel open. He can go into it, but that where that panel is open always kind of shifts because he's always jumping and knocking it. So it's arranged in different shapes always, and there's an opening sometimes and not openings other times. And he has this really interesting relationship to it, and he he learned, for instance, early on that if he pushed on this one area of it, it would open. And then I had to like lock it down more and stuff. And then he discovered that he couldn't open it anymore. That was pretty frustrating for him. And then he, when he's not in the pen and he wants to go in the pen and it's in a, and the opening is in a familiar spot, he can find his way back to it, um, which is great. Other times he's gets confused and he sees like his toy inside the pen and he's outside the pen there is an opening but the opening is like over here and he either is unfamiliar with it or whatever and he just sits there and he's like scratching at the pen and I'm like dude just just walk around but he hasn't he, he hasn't always figured that out and so he's like learning but like there are some things that are harder for him but he has learned something that we, we tried to train him intentionally was to, oh, if he needs to go outside, to go scratch at the door. So we learned that. Uh, go scratch at the door. If you want outside, we'll take you outside on the leash so you can uh, go to the bathroom. Well, uh, he learned that if he did that, we would take him out whether he needed to go or not. And that took him like two days. Like It did not take him long at all to figure that out. He just decided that I like to go outside, and whenever I go to the store and do this, they take me outside. How great is that? So he just he pretty much is now like the puppy who cried wolf, and we're gonna never know when he needs to go now because he just does it whenever he wants to just go play. Yeah, so he's training me. I don't know if that was his intention, but that is that is what happened. Uh, and get the correct response. That. Well, yeah, really, but, if, but if he wants to go outside, he's still going to use the one that I have to use every time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think that it, it'll be interesting to see because we need to work out some system with him. And I think that that, uh, knowing like what kind of system he can figure out and which ones he can't, are interesting. And I don't know how much of it's intentional either. So there's another one where he's definitely training me. And that is that I would take him out on the leash, and he likes to go outside and play. And sometimes I just take him out to do that, but sometimes I just take him out to go to the bathroom. Well, he discovered that if he goes right away, then usually I want to go in, right? It's raining. Like, I don't want to be standing out there. And so what he started doing, I am confident that this one is intentional. He figured out that he doesn't have to go in immediately if he doesn't go to the bathroom. He doesn't pee. He doesn't have to go in right away. Because I'll stand out there for a few more minutes waiting, like, okay, maybe he'll settle down and, and go. So I stand there, and while he plays and plays and plays, and then when I want to go in, then he pees. And I'm like, oh my, God. like, he's training me <laughs> to go outside and then, like, and, like, to keep me outside, too. So, yeah, uh... I don't know how much of it is intentional, but the, the learning aspect is really fascinating, and I'm just like just interested in watching him. And he's supposed to be, so he's a poodle, so they're supposed to be really smart. So I'm like, I can see them. I can see those wheels just sort of churning up there, and I'm like, oh god, what are you gonna do? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't let the dog understand the significance of phones. Because my dog does, and she'll just go up to someone who's on the phone, sit down, and just, mm -hmm. and you just look down, and you're like, no. 
<laughs> and she'll just then start barking. Uh. You go over, you grab the treat, you hand it to her, and she's quiet for a little while. She's training you. Oh, <laughs> you are trained. <laughs> yeah. My cousin's dog doesn't like the fact that he's on his phone pretty often. Mm. So, because it takes away from, the, from his own attention. And so, he'll walk up and my cousin's on his phone. He'll like walk up and put his paw on the phone and press it down. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'll bring it back up. <laughs> That's Our awesome. Brother, my, my brother's bird just attacks. Yeah, really? Yeah. You're sitting on the, the couch or whatever. You can slap the, the coffee hmm. table. Get our attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, German Shepherds are supposed to be really smart, too. Yeah. yeah. I I don't know. I think they're really interesting to watch. I, I like watching animals learn. I feel like I learn how to learn when I watch animals learn, but, and when I watch people learn, I like watching kids, I don't, I don't have kids, but I have nieces, a niece and nephews, and it's fun hanging out with them, and then handing them back off to their mother, um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, okay, uh, so, uh, my, my whole point with that whole story about the dog was that, I think that the, the dog learns this, this connection between cause and effect and they don't just learn that this is there's a connection they exploit the connection they take that and they they use it for what they want and that's uh an important aspect of of robot learning as well of course supervised learning requires an external teacher to show the robot what it did wrong uh, imitation and demonstration learning is based on observing a teacher. Here's an example of that. So this is this is how a lot of robots are are programmed. Um, something along these lines, I guess. Please show me the task. Please the objects. This is a little more advanced than typical. This is a. Finished. Let me have a look. This is more of a research one, but... Great. I found two objects. Now tell me when you are ready to demonstrate the task. Ready. Please demonstrate the task after the signal and tell me when you have finished. Finished. Okay, I have recorded the task demonstration. Would you like to do another demonstration? Yes. Yes. Relocate objects and tell me when you have finished. So you move them Finished. Let me have a look. Great, I found two objects. Tell me when you're ready. 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 Demonstrate after the signal.
Finished. Another demonstration. Yes. Relocate objects and tell me when you have finished. Finished. Let me have a look. Tell me when you're ready. So essentially does it again. Um, notice that he's kind of trying to teach it that it doesn't matter Finished. where these objects are located relative to each other. No. You need to go grab it, no more lift it, and One pour moment, it. And that's the important the task. part. So One it can before. learn that this I'm is... Able to do what you showed me. Next time I will know what you mean. It learns what's the important aspect. Let me have a look. I found two objects. Now I'm going to start. Not bad. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I think that um, there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, unanswered questions about that. Like, like, if you switched sides, would they be able to figure that out? I think that it should be able to differentiate the size. Yeah. And also, if you changed the orientation of the of the can, yeah, you know, I, could it figure that out? I think that there are there are a lot of things that are. I think it's a little bit contrived to make this work, uh, but at the same time, it, it is able to do some aspect of that. It was able to learn from these examples, and a lot of industrial robots. They aren't quite capable of the degree of adaptability shown in this video. This is more of a more of a uh, research oriented demonstration, but they this is how they do some of the programming in industrial settings too, where you say move here and it just you just essentially move the robot to there, or you manually are sitting there and you're controlling each axis and that's step one. You program these things in ways like this. The learning aspect uh, of this is it allows it to adapt to new situations, which is really cool. And variability is something that is so hard to deal with in automation. So this class is about robotics and automation. And we're, our project is, I mean, there's a, there's a blurred line in between those two ideas robotics and automation, but our project is more related to automation. Uh, but automation and uh, the difficulties that we have with it mostly are the same problems that we have in, in robotics, and that's that there is this big variability in what can happen. In a lot of manufacturing processes, for instance, there is so much variability, you don't know what how the part's going to come out uh, as far as orientation goes. Or if you've got like a whole bin of things or a hopper of things and you want to package them, it's fine to like have a human there, reach in the bin, grab something, put it in in the right orientation and package it. But if you want to have something do that automatically, that's very difficult. And so there are robots that you can buy industrial that can industrially that can do that by... Um, if you have the part model loaded in, it can recognize using the vision system the orientation of the part, pick it up, place it in the correct orientation for packaging or whatever, which is, I mean, really cool, really advanced stuff. I mean, this stuff, I mean, that was a research level thing not many years ago, and now it's actually out there in, in the robots that in, industrial people and... Uh, uh, manufacturers are actually using so pretty cool stuff very expensive by the way if you want uh, to buy an industrial robot um, they are uh, pretty complex machines with a lot of complex electronics on them and they'll, they'll run you hundreds of thousands of dollars
this. So, yeah, they're not cheap, but sometimes they're the right solution. They're not always the right solution, but sometimes they're the right solution. Okay, and then the future of robotics, I should be asking you what the future of robotics is. I, I really think that we're all on a little bit of a level playing field in robotics because um, it's so wide open right now that something that hasn't even been conceived of could be the next big thing. So, yeah, that's a cool area to work in, I think. All right, so that is it for seminar notes, period, actually, because this is the last class that we're going to use them uh, for. So I'm going to...